All right. Well, we are live with UK writer Steve Stark. Hello, Steve. How are you doing? Hello, Mike. Doing very well. How are you? Good. Doing pretty well. We were just talking about, uh, you know, uh, our uh, mutual neck of the woods there, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, as I was saying, it's uh, here in Florida. It's starting to cool down a little bit. But uh, we're still in, you know, we're still in the 90s anyways. Yeah. You know, it's it's still uh, it's, it's kind of warm. How's it going there? How's it? Uh, how's the uh, how are the temps shaping up? Uh, it's finally getting cooler. We had a hot yeah. summer for a change, but oh, uh, most of the time it rains here. <laughs> uh, right, right. A lot of rain. A lot. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we had weeks. It just stopped. We're we're kind of in a. I mean, for the last few days, it's been sunny, but before yeah. that, we just had weeks of constant rain. I mean, it was like really, and of course, yeah. Here, it's kind of like when when it's when it rains, it's kind of like it storms. Yeah, a tropical storm kind of. Uh, oh, it is. Yeah. It's just heavy duty rain. Uh, and but amazingly, once again, uh, no hurricanes. Right. Yeah, you guys may have noticed that over. I don't know if you get the hurricane reports. Yeah, because you never get hit by hurricanes. No, we're always so, fine. <laughs> yeah, Florida is, is is rather infamous for, you know, hurricanes. It's just, you know, because it's a leg, right, sticking out into the Atlantic, going down yeah. to the Caribbean. So, you know, the hurricanes come in, they hit the leg, and sometimes they pass through and then go back into florida oh. right you know i mean they'll pass through florida like they'll hit miami then yeah. they'll go up the coast and then they'll go back in to florida you know that has happened where a hurricane has actually hit the state twice you Jeez. know uh so it's yeah it can be pretty bad where i am though i'm about 30 miles inland so that's good i'm not yeah. right on the coast you know you and, any like damage to your house or anything like that when these come through? Uh, I would imagine I, you know, I've only been here for about two years, yeah. so I thus far no hurricanes, uh, only okay. some strong storms. I do have trees on my property, so yeah. Uh, yeah, you get branches, you know, falling stuff like that hitting the house. Yeah, so you know uh, that that will happen. But uh, hurricane wise, nothing major. And, you know, a few bad storms, but it's just typical. That's kind of what you live with, you know, here, yeah. uh, you know. But with hurricanes, it's it seems to be kind of a cyclical thing. I mean, I've lived many years in the south. So it's, you know, and on the coast literally yeah. like you know a few miles from the beach so when the hurricanes roll in you know that's where they're going to do their the damage and then when they proceed inland they immediately die off so you have like let's say a category three that hits mm -hmm. but once it's a few miles inland it's a category one because it's just lost all of its steam of course it's no no longer over the ocean right and so it's, you know, it's just like a bad storm. A category one is like, you know, 70 mile an hour winds, which, oh. which for us is like a typical, that's kind of like just a typical bad storm anyways, you know, yeah. like where you get those, those heavy gusts and so forth. But uh, yeah, it's been quiet. I mean, I, you know, I have been looking off and on uh, at the hurricane forecast yeah, And the hurricanes that have happened, you know, thus far have, you know, they form kind of in the southern Atlantic, like Caribbean area. And then they kind of just go into mid-Atlantic and they fizzle out, you know, so okay. it, it, nothing, not much. You know, it's it's this this season has not been much of anything and yeah. it's pretty much over the way yeah. I look at it is like. If nothing's happened by mid-September, it's just not going to happen, you know. So, okay. that, that, yeah, you know. But uh, enough about the hurricane. The weather. <laughs> but, yeah, let, let's get into your book. Now, Steve is, is uh, your, and this is your latest novel, right? It is, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. my first. Yeah. Your, his first and 
latest novel, A Hot Dose of Hell. This is it, folks. I've got this, you know, in my my pause right here. And uh, it is a hell of a novel. I recommend it. I'm going to go ahead now and put up, I'm going to share the Amazon page. Now, it's at this point, it's just on Amazon, right? Uh, it's on a few of the other places as well. Oh, cool. Uh, Amazon's the only one that uh, is print on demand. So you can get it. You can get the uh, print oh, copy. Oh, cool. Everywhere else is ebook. You can get it anywhere that does ebooks. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So there we go. Excellent, man. Nice. And so, so okay, you know, and this is the whole thing. It goes back when we had just mentioned this. Yeah. Uh, we, we were ta talking about this backstage. Uh, okay. So we met on Parlor, and. Parlor at that time for about a year, it seemed to me, was really hot. I mean, it was just gaining steam, you know, like month by month. It was expanding exponentially. You know, yeah. it was really getting hot. And of course, then it was uh, getting close to the election 2020. And somewhere in and around that time is when it got shut down. The powers that be basically, you know, deemed it dangerous, <laughs> whatever yeah. the hell. And it just got shut down. Uh, yeah. And uh, it never recovered. I mean, it's back now, but unfortunately. It's quiet over there. Yeah, yeah it's quiet. It's very it just, quiet. Yeah. Tumbleweed. It, 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 exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, so that's where we met, uh, you yeah. know, online. There were a ton of people. There were so many writers artists comic book artists you know i mean just, yeah. just uh, lots of comic book artists yeah yes yes and you know uh it, it was you know it's a fantastic platform and uh so it was kind of like uh, how, how should i say this there was a thing you know where obviously people on the left or the extreme left were yeah. really they were just hating this platform oh my god it was just getting uh, you know if you went to twitter people were just losing their minds <laughs> you know uh, about parlor it was just it was insane and so you know it was it just seemed like a matter of time and of course it got taken off but uh it was really great for a while you know getting the word out you know, and, and, you know, telling people about your various projects and so forth. Uh, and so for you, how was it? I mean, during that time now, up until it was quote unquote canceled, were you advertising a hot dose of hell on there? Yeah. Yeah. I was starting to build up momentum. I hadn't finished it yet at that time, but I knew I was right. going to be bringing it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah, just, yeah, hor just, well, kind of bad timing, you know, if yeah. they, I mean, if they had let the, 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 the platform, you know, uh, grow, but it seemed like everything, uh, obviously, there, there were so many things that were targeted during that period of time, you yeah. know, uh, that, uh, you know, it's, it was just like a tsunami of, uh, of, how should I put this woke, leftist attacks you know yeah. and this comes out in your book i mean it's yes. not it's not a main factor of the book but it's in the book you know yeah, and, and i yeah as i i interpreted it and uh you know it, it's uh that whole thing about the you know sjw culture the uh how would you say you know uh Oh boy, you know. So the the hypocritical upper class wokeists. Basically. Yeah, that's kind <laughs> of yeah. That that well yeah, and, and you know how people it's they have there's a saying for when these people are like, uh, oh, why, why is it escaping my brain now? You know when they're they're uh, kind of like they take an, a subject and they're just talking about it for points. Yes. Uh, and it's called, uh, there's a certain... It, a virtue signaling? Uh, thank you. God, why, yes. why did they just <laughs> went right out of my brain, man? 
uh, virtue signaling, that was the whole thing, right? I yeah, mean, absolutely. It, in the in the, <laughs> it's great in the novel uh, because the, these characters. Well, you know, uh, the this is. Let, let me just let me go to. I, I'm going to the Amazon page, and uh, so uh, let me just read a couple of paragraphs here. Um, because we get it, we, it gets right into that. But um, here's here's the the first couple of paragraph paragraphs of uh, the description on a hot dose of hell. A deadly new drug has hit the streets of Skarmouth, one which turns users into bloodthirsty maniacs with superhuman tolerance for pain. Through insidious design, a large quantity has fallen into the hands of squatters occupying the derelict Victoria Hotel. It's a bad place for a group of woke, virtue-signaling social media influencers to promote their new homeless charity, but they've got a PR story in the making. One of their party is searching for a long-lost sister, and if they can find her, they believe the stunt could bring them international attention. And so you have these characters... That, I mean, they're, it's classic. It's pretty hilarious, actually. That that's, I mean, that part of that whole part of it, I found really amusing. And I, it, it. yeah, the the it works very well. Uh, of course, you know, once the once everything once they get to the Victoria Hotel and things start ramp, ramping up, it just never stops. It's kind of like yeah. a nonstop. Uh, you know, to me, for me, I mean, it's just, uh, it's wonderfully ultra violent, very gory, and it just keeps going. It's relentless. And that's my kind of novel. Uh, you know, it, <laughs> it just, uh, folks, you know, if you like a, a, a an extremely strong, uh, gory kind of you know and I, I i kind of i hesitate in saying zombie because it's kind you know it's not they're not they're not really zombies it's more not like really uh, zombies it's kind of like 28 days later I would yeah, a little more like that yeah. right exactly you know there's 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 a drug involved and uh yeah it it's it's an interesting thing too because you know i i love the um cover of the book now how did you arrive at this cover because it's got various things it's, it's really great it kind of nails the entire covid thing i it mean does, it does doesn't it yeah it, it really <laughs> does and so so how did that come about and, and why did you choose that that particular cover well i thought it'd be attention grabbing and uh that it might you know, it, it tells you what the story is. It sets the tone, I think. Um, I wanted something that was to do with the drugs because that's what the, the point of the story is, you know, the drugs that have been put out that are turning everyone. And it's obviously a play on Skull and Crossbones as well as the uh, the old, like, hazardous waste, kind of toxic kind of thing. Yes. I like the idea of putting the mask on the character but also giving it the clown smile as well for clown world yes. which is very much associated with all the woke behaviors and woke ideals exactly exactly yeah man yeah the mask was a great touch i mean and that really really came into play i mean got for you know for a year and a half yeah. the whole thing of masking you know yeah. mandatory masks what and well what can be said i mean you know I don't know what YouTube's policy. I'm sure they're going to put a little thing on this video, but mandatory masking, mandatory vaccines, the whole deal. You know, it yeah. was kind of like here, you know, the left's argument was, was like, well, there was never any mandatory vaccines, but that's not true. There's a lot there of pressure. Well, a lot that, of pressure. Yeah. Right. The way that they did it, and it was a very slick way, is that the government basically pressured the corporations who gladly virtue signaled you know the whole thing about get get your vaccine if you're not vaccinated and you can't present a vaccine you know certificate or passport you, yeah. you don't get into our restaurant you don't get into our store 
and that's yeah, they did it over here as well right exactly yeah. so that is mandatory there's no doubt about it that is a mandate because yeah. if you are cut off from goods and services <laughs> there there i mean that's that's pretty much it so that's how the government here sleazily got got away with it because they were like yeah but we're not man you know making anything mandatory but yeah, they just they put it out is, to the companies exactly yeah. and the of course these i mean these corporations which you know it's the strangest thing just they they look at numbers they crunch numbers that's what they do so if they see something is trending and this is the toxicity of twitter in my opinion i think you may agree is that once something is for instance is trending on twitter a corporation will look at it and go oh shit we need to do that you know yeah. look it's a problem we need to ban this guy or we need to uh you know uh change this product yeah i, I think mean, everywhere has made the mistake of thinking that twitter is the customer service department of the world and it's so representative of such a small part of the population it's yes. not really at all is it yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's as a matter of fact that was I think something that Elon Musk was uncovering. Yeah, was the fact that Twitter is just hyped anyways. It's a bunch of bots. There's yeah. just millions of bots working on that on that platform, and it's not real. You know, that's the thing. It is. You know, it, it even when you when you think about it in those terms, it's even more insidious, right? Because. Mm -hmm. It's not a bunch of people that are virtue signaling and trying to shut stuff down. You know, it's a, it is literally millions of bots that yeah. are doing this. They're you know they're being programmed to go out and attack. You know, and say, well, yes, Aunt Jemima needs that. You need to change that name. So now yeah. it's the it's the Pearl Milling Company or something. <laughs> stupid name and they get yeah. rid of aunt jemima on the cover and yeah and yet she was free i mean she made a ton of money promoting that back in the day you know the the yeah. literal character uh you know the person that the uh, uh, who aunt jemima was named after yeah. because she was making a buttload of money yeah. you know that was the amazing thing about it so uh but they changed it they just buckled like everybody else, you know, started buckling. So, you know, there, it was just that, and we're still living it. I mean, now we're back, you know, Steve, obviously you're aware of the fact that we, we have elections coming up mid, what we call midterm elections yeah. coming up in November. So once again, things are ramping up here. You're starting to see all kinds of crap going on. And we will see, wait until October. Yeah. You know, it's just going to be crazy, man. It will be absolutely insane because once again, they will be doing their best to, you know. Uh, demonize the other side, basically. Uh, yes, yeah, thwart yeah. any, any, you know, chance. And, and you know, it, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, it's short of somehow canceling the elections in some way mm. uh you know the democrats and the far left know they're in trouble so uh you know it's it, it there's a lot of desperation i mean you know you've got the president who makes and i'm sure you saw that the whole thing about that very v for vendetta speech that oh yeah, that yeah I saw that. Made. yeah. holy shit <laughs> I was just like, okay, this is as direct as it gets. Uh, yeah. You know, it's like he is literally targeting targeting seventy five million people. That's he just just did that. You know, live. Uh, it's just hard to believe. And uh, you know, but of course, I know most people. I, I would say, you know, consider Biden a puppet. Anyway, yeah, we get that impression over here that he's he just doesn't know what's going on, and someone's just feeding him the lines. Right? Didn't he? Didn't he pull the uh, anchor man where he read the teleprompter? He oh, read yeah. the part out loud well, that he wasn't supposed to read and stuff. Yeah, yeah he, he's done that a few times. <laughs> you know, he just, it's just it's hard to believe. You know, and people were yeah. like, you know, I, well, 
uh, we, we could go on and on about this, but this is something that, you know, it's uh, one thing I like, and I think this is, it's, it's a great thing and we should get into this because your, your book, A Hot Dose of Hell, it's a great horror novel. One, I think it totally succeeds with what you're trying to do. I love the setting of the Victoria Hotel. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that it really works with this, yeah. with this you know, uh, kind of plot. And, uh, but it has that, you know, there's a, a certain percentage of a political angle, you know, yeah. on it. You're, you're saying something. You know, you're not just, it's not just, you know, a Stephen King novel where he's just writing a, a, a horror thing and he's not really saying anything else. It's just for the sake of horror. The great thing about A Hot Dose of Hell is that you're, you're, you've got, you know, you're, you're absolutely directly uh, uh, satirizing the woke crowd, the virtue signaling crowd. Yeah. You know, uh, and that, that's, that's a very welcome, you know, breath of fresh air. Yeah, uh, no one's really doing that, are they? There's no, not, they're not. not a lot of that going on. No, there isn't. You know, they're, they're ripe. They're ripe for satire, and not too many people seem to be doing it in genre fiction or entertainment in general. Right. I know there are right. some good satirists out there, like uh, Andrew Doyle, mm -hmm. people like that. Um, but yeah, not not in fiction or anything. No, no. Yeah, there there are. I have seen some movies now that yeah. uh, uh, recently, and I, I and these are low budget. You you will not see like a, a big budget film. Of course, they wouldn't touch the stuff with a ten foot pole. No, uh, you know, uh, if it's a, if, I mean, in Hollywood, it's just the opposite, anyways. If they do get political, it's just Trump derangement syndrome. Yeah, I mean, they're just insane about you know the the whole uh, Trump thing. And so uh, the I've seen a few low budget films that uh, there is a bit of satire, and there's a few on Tubi. As a matter of fact, uh, that uh, and the thing about Tubi is great because, uh, you know, the, it's an equal opportunity channel. They have yeah. a few movies that are definitely they lean to the right, a few movies that lean to the left. And they're satires, they're, poli they're political satires, or at least they have political satire within them. You know, yeah. uh, and they're a genre like you, a horror or science fiction or whatever, you know, but not much. No. You know, as no, we were I, saying. I think maybe uh, The Hunt is a good the example. Hunt, that was The Hunt is one of the best. Yeah. As far as movies go, it's one of my favorite. And it, it's hard to believe that's a Blumhouse film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. I mean, Blumhouse, let's put it this way. Blumhouse is like, I don't know, they're like the Betty Crocker of horror or something where it's just kind of like they have their model, right? And it works and it makes yeah. them millions of dollars. So they're like, hey, that worked really well. Let's just rip, you know, our movies do off that again and again and, yeah. and do it again and again. And they do it. They, they literally use the exact same tropes in yeah. a dozen of their horror films and it works i mean those films just continuously keep making money because it's almost like a pavlov's dog theory <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where like the audience is expecting like the bell to ring yeah. or whatever they just man react to it yeah right they're cues and they love it and i'm like going look man you know there's only so many times you can watch a person being dragged across the floor by unseen forces. It just, <laughs> yeah. It's just bad, you know, but so, so that's the way I look at Blumhouse. Generally speaking, I think they're very, very mainstream, safe horror. Yeah. That's what they do. And it's, were, were they behind the purge? They may have, that, yeah, I, that may have been Blumhouse. Yeah. Or at least some people directly right. you know because there are some other outlets where you know they kind of like there's a certain relationship if yeah. it wasn't directly blumhouse guaranteed there were some blumhouse people involved right. you know but that yeah i was totally stunned i mean the hunt is the the best blumhouse film i've ever seen 
Yeah. No, no <laughs> doubt about it. I mean, it's hilarious. It's yeah. Funny, yeah. Oh my God. The, the, the woman who plays the main character is just so wonderfully droll. Like her, the whole deadpan delivery of all of the lines. She's just, and she's like this, this girl from Mississippi that gets yeah. tossed into this whole thing. And her character is fantastic. I love the acting in the film. Uh, you know, yeah, it, it's the story is great. I think they hit a lot of things on the head. Uh, and, you know, that was a, that was a film, Steve, that got, it was yanked. Universal Studios was the distributor. Oh, really? I yes. didn't know that. Yeah, right at the, once again, just before the 2020 election, Universal Studios yanked the distribution on that film. And it was not available until after the election. In other words, until it didn't matter anymore. Yeah. You know, they that's what they did uh, with that film. But it's just, man, they did... You know, it, it's a it's really a great film in the sense that, yes, OK, the satire, you know, basically it's elites uh, that, you know, get people, they they uh, kidnap people and then they they, you know, put them on, in an area and they hunt them. That's that's essentially the, the thing. Right. And yeah, uh, of course, there are, there are so many really cool twists in the hunt that you don't see coming. You know, yeah. uh, it, it's, it works on many levels. The comedic timing with the actors is fantastic. They, they really do a great job. Hillary Swank is great. And, you know, they oh, yeah, do and a, that fight scene as well. Oh, the fight scene is great. That's amazing. <laughs> it is, it is just, you know, it is obviously, uh, I don't want to, you know, it, it's kind of, I, I hesitate in saying this. It's a low budget film. You know, but they do so much with what they had, you know, budget wise. I mean, I would imagine it was a few million dollars. That's probably that's, uh, you know, what I'm thinking. Uh, but they really used every dollar on the screen. I mean, it's just got everything works. Nothing looks cheap. They really set it up very well. Uh, and. It's just a crime because, you know, somebody at Blumhouse has got a spine. Obviously, they were like, look, we're going to make this political horror film and we're going to release it right before the election. That was, you know, that was their plan. That yeah. was I, and they just got screwed. I mean, hmm. boom, they got, you know, Universal is like, no, no, we've we've gotten too many virtue signaling, you know, complaints. You, you know, that happened. Oh my God, yeah. you know, uh, so yeah, in terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, film, political films, uh, you know, I would say at least recent political films, that's it. That's yeah. the one that really counts because that was the one they banned. Mm -hmm. that, that, that was it. Universal just, they, they, they basically banned the film. They were like, yeah, we're, you know, you can't see it. You can't you're not before the election because it's there were it 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 says a few universal truths, you know, that would have got I think it would have got people thinking, you know, Blumhouse is very popular. Yeah. They were looking at having maybe millions of people watch that film. You know, I mean it was a calculated thing that universal did uh mm. you know by by yanking the film before the election so yeah no good no good yeah no not not There's good at so, all such little of that sort of stuff around and then they're blocking it all it's like yeah yeah like, i mean it was it, it was much like the hunter biden laptop thing yeah right? i mean a month a month before it, yeah, the election, Hunter. But I mean, it, it's just insane. You know, there's a new. Although I, I have to hand it to him, and I think you'll agree, this is like making me think that there's hope, because yeah. you have these companies like the Daily Wire, and uh, a few. Uh, well, Breitbart, Blaze TV, 
<clears throat> they're all getting into the movie business and mm. TV business. So Daily Wire, after Gina Carano was unceremoniously dumped from Twitter, you may recall that. Uh, yeah. Gina Carano is an actress. She she was in um, The Mandalorian. Yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, The Mandalorian, right? And she said something that was totally innocuous. Yeah. I mean, I, I read the, the the tweet. She was just saying, stating the truth. Yeah, she was just and, saying, and, basically, let's be nice to each other. Like, don't uh, hate your neighbor. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, how dare you? We will ban you now. And they, they yeah. fired her from uh, The Mandalorian. And of course, this is Disney. Yeah. What do you expect? Disney is yeah. just, man. And I'm in, you know, of course, I'm, I'm here in Florida. That whole oh, yeah, you're thing, right there. Yeah, I'm right. I mean, and of course, Ron DeSantis is the governor. And yeah. he's going head to head with Disney. I mean, it's glorious, man. He's just like, look, you guys, you're, you know, you're in the first place. There have been within the last year, there have been about a dozen arrests for human child trafficking by Disney employees. Uh, you have Disney World. I'm just like, yeah. okay, how sleazy can you get here? This is, you know, this should be sending a direct message to people, yet. You've got all these people defending Disney, like this corporation that has definitely got some serious issues. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm, I'm saying like, you know, in, with, as far as like these employees, you know, trafficking, human trafficking, that's about as bad as it gets short of m mass murder. I mean, it's, yeah. it's bad. Uh, so he's been going, uh, he's been butting heads. DeSantis has been butting heads, uh, with Disney and, you know, they, strangely enough, I didn't know this until it came out, you know, and DeSantis was talking about it, but Disney world was considered a state unto itself. They got this, their own state status within Florida, like their own world. Legally, the whole thing. And he was like, DeSantis was like, no, that's not going to happen anymore. You're not protected. You will not have protected status. So he cut that. Of course, that just drove them insane. You know, I mean, that yeah. was just like, man, you know, he's just taking it. You know, he's, he's, he's doing it to it. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's so you see this translation with Disney. And of course, Disney owns Marvel, right? So you Which got why that's gone down the toilet. Oh my God, it's just embarrassing. It, yeah. it, the whole thing is just like, you know, you can watch. There's a variety of people. You know, I tend to watch like, uh, you know, uh, people that will. Uh, uh, I mean, y there's only so much you can take, but like, and I, I will not watch She-Hulk. Now, that, that is like a new Marvel TV show. Yeah, I've heard about it. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've, I've seen clips. That That's yeah. enough. But, uh, man, just watching some people eviscerate that show is hilarious. Because it's just, once again, it's kind of like, you know, they have a multi-million dollar budget per show. Yeah. And they spend like $10 on the screenplay for it. That that's basically it. It's like the writing is so shit. It, it's hard yeah. to believe, man. You know, it's like you just think like, why waste your time doing this? And of course, once again, anything like that, you're going to have this massive, you know, uh, virtue signaling campaign with the woke left, where they're just oh, if you don't like it. You're something you race women or sexist. whatever misogynist yeah whatever the hell and uh, you know it's the classic it's you know whatever and and uh but it's undeniably brain dead stuff it's just so ridiculously bad that uh, it it just boggles the mind how you know because you know if you're doing a it doesn't matter it's, if it's a tv show or if it's a film and it's like in a studio setting. Yeah. It's, 
you would, it, it, this is basically what happens is that the guy writes the screenplay. Many people read it before it's approved, you know? So it's like, okay, well, this is ready to be filmed. Uh, it just doesn't seem like they they're doing that. This is like the guy writes it. He's like, here, film this, you know, yeah. it, it just makes no sense. The stuff is, it's just, uh, are they just chucking stuff together to fill up their their channel? They've got that streaming service. That seems like that's it. what they're doing. Just yeah. anything. I think yeah. so, and I think they're yeah they're they're absolutely not concerned with quality at all. Hmm. There is just no and it, and and I guess it just doesn't matter to them, you know. Uh, I I don't know about like you know the ratings with She Hulk whatever and one of the things that gets me about you know like some youtube channels that i subscribe to and i'll watch mm. well these guys cover she hulk a lot like you will see like five episodes in a row where it's nothing but she hulk and they're they hate it so yeah. they're just ripping it but it might be causing an opposite effect they're creating publicity for it they're making people watch it right yeah like even people that hate it, be, they they might be like, "Oh my god, this sounds so bad! I gotta see it." Yeah, that maybe that's the game. Yeah, right. You know, because I haven't heard anything. I mean, you know, a lot of shows rightly do get canceled. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're just crap, crap shows, and they end up getting canceled. And people are like, "Yeah," because it's garbage. And uh, but uh, you know, certain shows just keep kind of like moving you know they, they they keep lingering uh yeah. and uh it's it's just like who how knows? is the walking dead still going how is that still going? i have no idea man i have who, no who's idea who's still watching that yeah it's hard to believe it is uh you know the one thing about walking dead is that i did start watching it you know i, I watched it like the first two seasons yeah and it was primarily, I was really interested because they were shooting the series on film. I don't know if you know this, but it was being I shot on, it was shot on super 16 millimeter film to give it that look, you know. Is that, that when Frank Darabont was doing it? Yes, when yeah. Frank Darabont was doing it. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I think I'll watch it, you know. So I was watching and I was like, well, this is all right, you know, and then Somewhere at the end of the second season, or maybe it was the beginning of the third, I just dropped out. I was like, I, just, uh -huh. I can't take it anymore. You know, I, it was that that was it, and uh, I, I just can't believe it's still going. Uh, I lasted a bit longer. I got to I think season seven. Okay. That far. It it had its its ups and downs, and then it just completely flatlined, in my right. opinion, anyway. But somehow it's still going. It's got spin-off after spin-off. I don't know anyone who watches it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anybody either. I really don't. You know, uh, it's I, I when you just said that, I thought it was like canceled a long time ago. Yeah. It's hard to believe it's still going, man. That's a that's absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, I it it's. You know, speaking of which, it's like, you know, I, one thing I wanted to, you know, get kind of get into a little bit is mm -hmm. that just getting back to your novel, A Hot Dose of Hell. Yeah. Uh, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about, like, for instance, horror or, you know, genre writers in general, like from from any period of time. Uh, what would be what would who would you be considered to be like? For instance, I don't know in your top five. Okay. I mean, yeah, okay. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, so Clive Barker, definitely. Yeah. Books of Blood are like my favorites. Yes. They're amazing. They're so good. Uh, I'd say James Herbert as well. Do you know you know James Herbert? James Herbert. The yes. rats. Yeah. The rat. Yeah, I was just gonna say the rats. Yeah. I go um, Stephen King. You know, you can't beat Stephen King, really. Early Stephen King, especially. Yes. Um, Joe Lansdale, who I know you've done some work with. I love his early stuff, his early horror yes. stuff and uh, crime stuff. Let me think now. I'd think of a fifth favorite. Hmm. Sean Hudson. 
Sean, you know Hud Sean Hudson, yeah. No, uh, I'm not British, the name. Yeah, uh, splatterpunk writer. He's around the same time as as James Herbert. I'd say. Oh, okay. Say five, right there. Yeah, okay. just off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good list. Yeah, and and I agree. I, I think Stephen King, his early stuff. Yeah. Was very good, and and when I like, I mean early, like Carrie, uh, you know, uh, The Stand. It, Salem's Lot, yeah. Salem's Lot, all prime, all prime. Uh, I think, I mean, I the last thing I read of King's was The Dome. Oh, there right. was this, yeah, huge. It was like, <laughs> I think it was like a thousand page novel. Once again, one of his epic things, yeah. a thousand page novel, where this dome suddenly appears over this town. And they can't get in. I don't think people can get out. Uh, you know that kind of thing. And yeah, I was just like, okay, that's he's he's past it. He's definitely, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and now he's just he's this angry old wokester uh, yeah. on Twitter that just uh, the dude is just out. Of, he's out of his mind, man. I mean, yeah. some of the stuff he says on Twitter, I'm just like, whoa, dude. You've gotten, you, it's kind of like Rob Reiner, man. Yeah. You know, same thing. I, it just boggles my mind. I don't know what, uh, you know, well, it could be definitely attributed to, and, you know, people have said that, you know, Trump derangement syndrome is real. Mm -hmm. Like it is a real malady. <clears throat> I would believe that now. I, I, I would definitely believe that now where it's, it's some kind of a, maybe it's a, it's a virus of some sort, uh, but uh, I, it is something that has definitely infected these guys because they just start talking about stuff in the first place that doesn't even exist. There mm. was a thing that uh, I forget exactly what it was. This was kind of re within the last month and I don't, I'm not on Twitter. So I don't, you know, unless probably, somebody probably else, a good shout. yeah, oh, it is. Yeah. I couldn't uh, after, especially, I mean, it's been years now, you know, and yeah. it was like, I think what happened for me was like when parlor was kicking, yeah. uh, I was like, screw Twitter. I don't need Twitter, man. Parlor is way better. And for that time it was, mm. it was definitely better than Twitter when it was, when it was really, when it was really picking up steam. Uh, and so I dropped it. I was just like, I just don't need this stuff. And, uh, so, but occasionally people will talk, like I'll read some news stuff and they'll be like, well, Stephen King said this, you know, about some, and it typically, of course, he's railing against Trump or in this case, he was railing against DeSantis, Ron DeSantis, our governor over something that DeSantis never even said. Mm. It was one of those things. And people pointed out, they were like, hey, Stephen King, DeSantis never even said that. And and Stephen King eventually apologized. Well, he where was, did he get it from? Where did he think it was said? Uh, well, that was the whole thing. That's how those things, you know, t Twitter is like this. Somebody will suggest something. And uh. so, like like it, within hours, that something is real. It's yeah. actually happened and people just take it without looking into it because they believe their their ideology so strongly. They don't need to look into backup like yeah. for verification. There's no vetting required, Steve. They yeah, just got to be skeptical. Yeah. Oh, you, you totally do. These people aren't skept skeptical at all. And this actually happens on the right as well. Yeah. They'll take a story and run with it. And it's like, no, 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 that's not true. Because that did it not happen. Follows, follows the line of what they already believe. So they're taking it a step further. Of course, yeah, of course that happens. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. It just happens like that we're, we're talking about Stephen King. And unfortunately, he's just one of those guys that he's become the classic old man yelling at clouds yeah. in, in yeah. his old age. You know, it's just, uh, it's, it's a sad thing. Uh, I think it's a bad thing if you generally, I imagine he's living in a lovely 
big mansion and he just watches his TV and his social media, doesn't really get out too much apart from to be ferried to and from a TV show or something like that. Right. The rest of the time he's writing, that's your window on the world, isn't it? You know, as yeah, you see the it. TV, you see the social media, you think that's reality. Yes, exactly. And he's, yeah, he's not doing, I don't think he's going to conventions or, you know, film festivals and stuff anymore. So yeah. he's not getting out, you know, getting to the crowds and stuff. And yeah, uh, it's like, you know, it's, uh, it's frightening. Like in, in some respects, like, because with some of these people, including King, it, it's become like almost like a matter of life and death with mm. these people. I mean, they really think that, you know, people like Ron DeSantis represent like the new Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> it's some such bullshit uh, that's coming after them. You yeah. know, uh, this is like, oh, God, good Lord. Um, but OK, enough of poor Stephen King. Yeah. So, so, you know, we've talked about, you know, uh, your, your five favorite authors, what would you, and this might, this is definitely probably a bit more difficult. Okay. Uh, in the last, let's say in the 21st century, let's go from 2000 until 2022. Okay. Could you, could you give us your top five horror films? From 2000. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give it a go. So okay. The Descent. Have you seen that? Neil Marshall's yes. Descent? Yeah, that's got to be great up there. Film. That's a, a great film. Um, yes. Five five girls go into the cave, and that's a bad enough situation in itself when they get lost in the cave. <laughs> it, it's so it is. It's claustrophobic. It's so uncomfortable. Then monsters show up. It's yeah. not bad enough before that even happens. Yeah. And those yeah. creatures are great, man. Yeah. I mean, they really did a fantastic job. You know, I'm not even sure how they did it. Obviously, some of it's real cave. Some of it must have been, you know, like a set created, you know, as a cave. I, I would assume. Yeah. Uh, but the, it, it's just done so well. You know, I don't know the budget of that film. Uh, it's really, I think it, it is high end horror. Yeah. Uh, it uh, the acting is just great it's one of those flicks now it's an all-girl cast right yeah you, you don't when you're watching it you're not thinking oh yes they're just they just got all girls because they're trying to, to virtue signal no it's, no we didn't think about stuff like that back then did we no, no yeah not even no. then 2005 i think that right that came out we didn't even think about it that way no yeah. it was just like okay these girls are going spelunking yeah that, that was basically it you know and you just never thought about it. And it's, it's, yeah. It, and it never, the great thing about it too is within the film, it never gets into anything like that. They never, his characters are real. They're not degrading. They don't, you know, spend their time like ripping on men or whatever, you know. I mean, obviously, this is, it's hard to believe 10 years later. That would all be happening. It would all start happening around 2015. That's when it really started kicking in. And, uh, you know, but yeah, 2005, it was just like, hey, let's make this great horror film, you yeah. know? Uh, and it is. It's, I would agree. I would probably, in, as far as the last, in the 21st century, I, I would, I would put that in my top five. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd go next. I'd go for the collector. I like that a lot. Ah, uh, the that collector. One. Yeah, that for me was the best of that kind of torture <laughs> genre. I like that one the most out of all of them. It was considered like a saw knockoff, but I just thought it was much better. Uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely would agree that it was better than Saw. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, there were a couple of things with Saw that I liked in. It wasn't with the first film. I just really didn't get into that one. But there were some other aspects of a few other Saw films that were that were good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the the collector was something else. It was a unusual type of whatever you want to call that kind of film. I mean, I guess you could say torture or something. Uh, 
I'm not I've, really. I've heard it called torture, torture porn. That is torture genre. porn, I <laughs> guess. There's, but there's also a lot of action in that film. Yeah, there is. Yeah, you know, so it's it's kind of it's a it's definitely like a cross subgenre film where it's just got a, a certain elements that really come together well. You know, yeah. you know, so that yeah, that's a good choice. Yeah, and then uh, I'd say the Midnight Meat Train. Have you seen that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah, that Jimmy was Jones. Yeah. actually one of my favorite Clive Barker adaptations. Yeah, yeah mine too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really good. And that was that guy that became a huge star. Oh, yeah, uh, Bradley Cooper. Yeah, before yeah. he, when he was just starting off, it, it may have been like his, it may have been his first starring role. Yeah. In a film, it was close to it, you know. And uh, it was so well done. Yeah, and Vinnie Jones, man, what a great evil character. Yeah. I mean, he really does it. I think it's his best screen performance. Yeah, I think actually. so. Yeah. You know? he, he, he only says one word, doesn't he, in the whole film? He, he, he does. <laughs> but his, his presence is just, that's all that's required, you know, yeah. in that. And he, obviously, he's done some really good comedy. There's yeah. no doubt about it. He's in some of those films. The Guy you know. Ritchie films. Yeah, the Guy Ritchie films yeah. and a few other like in that similar vein. Yeah. <clears throat> and he, he's good. Those are, you know, it's, he, he does a good comedic thing. But, man, as far as drama goes, like strict, you know, like no, very little humor. Uh, that one is, man, he's he's really good in that really great flick and especially in the la in, in this century you know yeah. uh, i would i would put that way up there as well that's it's a great film yeah that's a good one uh so i'd, I'd say probably hostel next which is another one in that same sort of genre is uh the collector a big yes. fan of hostel i thought that was a really solid film and really unexpected as well yes yeah yeah that was uh that was uh Eli Roth. Yeah. yeah. Yes. He's good. I like Eli Roth. Um, yeah, he's good. He's good. And he loves horror. You can yes. tell. Yeah, he's just yeah. a big fan, you know. He brought the gore back. He helped bring gore back. Cause he gore really had, did. Had died off a little bit, hadn't it, with uh, all the sort of teen slasher movies got less and less violent, I think. Yeah. It was very yeah. pretty, and, and you didn't really see very much. And then they brought Gore back big time with yeah. uh, things like he, Hostel. Yeah, he and Rob, well, Rob Zombie did too. Yeah, he did, he did a very good with with House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah, I think he did a great job of just getting really graphic and sick yeah. with the violence. I mean, although it wasn't once again, it wasn't. I, well, you, I guess you could say it was the graphic nature of it was over the top, but. It was kind of violent, but it was mm. also just a weird, you know, film that it went from that kind of thing of, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind of vibe. But it also has the supernatural elements to it, you know, which yeah. which is kind of a different thing as far yeah. as uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. But Eli Roth, I mean, I would I, I think Hostel was really I even liked Hostel, too. Yeah, I did as well. No, that was pretty good. Uh, took it a little bit further again, didn't it? It, it did. Oh boy, man, <laughs> he, he was. Some of the scenes in that are just really. But man, Green Hell is just. Oh yeah. yes. boy, I've that's my that favorite. That is my favorite Roth. And you know what's really great about that film, and, and what really kind of got me, uh, I, I it upped my appreciation for Eli Roth and my respect for the guy was, was the fact that, you know how that, what happened with that film, it was delayed. There was like this big, like almost like a two year lapse yeah, before it was, was uh, released, distributed, you okay. know? And uh, so the setting is fantastic. It's like you have these woke virtue signaling, yeah. uh, <laughs> Greenpeace activists, that are going into the jungle, a uh, Peruvian jungle, to find this tribe that is supposedly going to be, 
you know, they're in danger of being extinct, right? And they and think they're going to save them. Right. And they think <laughs> they're going to save them. And that was the entire setup <laughs> for the film. The plane crashes and then all hell breaks loose. Yeah. And <laughs> it is so great. It is Eli Roth saying, look, you idiots. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't yeah. realize the reality of, of what is going on. You know, it's that there, there, there's a guy I, I, you know, he, he speaks, he talks about cultural relativism a lot. And I think that's the whole thing. It's like a person will view, like they'll say, oh yeah, you know, it's like that couple that went to, uh, that like, it was like the mountains of Iran or Pakistan for uh, a, like a biking tour. And they're oh, like, yeah. oh yeah, things will be fine. And then they got beheaded. Yeah. And uh, because they view the world as, as they, they look at people and they're like, yes, but people are good everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just because there's a few bad people doesn't mean that they're all that way. Yes, they can be. Because, yeah. <laughs> because if there's a culture of violence, and yeah. there is, there can be a culture of violence in religions. We've seen that everywhere. It doesn't, you know, it's not just you know, with one religion, but we've seen cultures of violence. They will kill you. There's no doubt that that, that is what they're, the, and they cannot wait to kill you. That, yeah. that, that is the thing. And I think that Eli Roth uh, just hit it on the head. He nailed that idea so well. Maybe that's, you know, maybe there was a problem because it was a strange thing that that film, Green Hell, was delayed so mm. much and when it came out it didn't come out to much fanfare it no, wasn't I saw it years later years right. after it came out yeah right exactly you know and uh it uh it was uh, i think so, it was something that they were trying to i just don't think the studio was behind it at all whoever or let's say let's put it this way the distributor I think yeah. that they were just like, ah, hey, yeah, it's not really speaking our language. So, you know, we're not really going to push this film too much. And I'm sure they just got complaints, Maybe. complaints after complaints, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah. It's got, a, it, it's got a lot of similarities to Hostel, though, doesn't it? Really. When you think I, about it, I it's, just, you know, people blindly wandering into trouble in a dangerous it, situation, not knowing they're surrounded by danger. Right, except in in this case they're being tortured and eaten. Yeah, true. Uh, by by cannibals, and it's yeah. just so great. I mean, and some of those scenes are hardcore. Yeah, man. I mean, I was just like, you know, hostile was one thing. I mean, it was it was it's 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 hard. It is hardcore. It's you know, hostile is definitely like, whew, man. Some of those sequences are just hard to take hmm. uh, <laughs> but in green hell it was just like uh, you know i mean it, it's almost like well look that's kind of what you get for for you know your cultural relativism that that's what's going to happen to you if you think that you're just magically going to def uh, befriend these cannibals yeah that that's what's going to happen you're going to you're gonna get eaten they will eat yeah. you because you're food you know <laughs> uh i just yeah that for me that was that's one of my favorites yeah, i would put that in my top five uh, because it had something to say i i think that was you know it, it it was it was a really you know uh it made a, a really great point and i think that's why it i'm gonna i'm gonna look more into that i know that people you know, gore hounds, people that appreciate a good gore film, they loved it. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I think it was generally loved across the board from from that aspect, you know. Uh, but I think a lot of people were triggered by the whole, you know, hey, they just ate a bunch of Greenpeace people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I just love it. Just, I savor the, it's just the, so, so when I, saw, right. And I, I saw that and I was like, man, wait a second. Eli Roth is a genius. This is freaking, this is beyond above and beyond 
you know, the call of just a horror film. You know, yeah. I mean, you could just, you could basically what you could call hostile a, another version of a most dangerous game. You yeah. know, the, the old the story, which is even, God, I think it was made. Uh, first version may have been made like in the late 1920s, early 1930s, the most dangerous game where people are, you know, trapped on an island by this crazy guy and they're hunted. You know, that was just like the hunt. You know, there, there are, this is the, there's a theme there. Uh, although it wasn't, none of that stuff is torture porn. Um, you know, yeah, there, was no, there was no hunting in Hostel, was it? It was just for the thrill of torturing people. Right, yeah, they just yeah. got, they, they abducted them with the hot chicks, the Romanian girls or whoever <laughs> they were. And uh, then they tortured them. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, 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 the one scene with the guy that, you know, he comes into the locker room and the other guy is there who's, who's trying to escape, right? But he's trying to make himself look like he's part of the hunters or uh, the, the group. Of uh, they have the card, yeah. You know, I forget what they're called, but they have the little thing with uh, elite, on the, elite hunting. They called it, didn't uh, they? Elite hunting, right? Yeah. And the guy is just bragging about how he's tortured this person, yeah. and the guy is like trying to hold his sanity together to make it, you know, to convince this guy that he's one of them. Mm. What a great scene! Yeah, it's good. You know? Very tense. Yeah. Oh, very and, tense. Uh, really uncomfortable. That guy just, he makes your skin crawl, doesn't he, that guy? Yeah, he was perfect. He was, yeah. he was absolute. I mean, God, you know, so, yeah, it, it, Eli Roth is, he's one of the, I mean, he's, he's one of our modern greats. I, I haven't heard much from him recently. No. Um, you know, uh, they may, I think, I don't know if he's done anything after, uh, the uh, green horror thing there. I know he's done uh, like a documentary series about horror. Yeah. I yeah, he that. did. He, well, he also, he made a film about the aftermath. Well, it's actually the earthquake in Chile. And then the aftermath of the earthquake. It's and like a bit how, serious for him. Right. Yeah, well, it is it is total fiction. But his idea, his premise was like, okay, there's this big, 7.0 earthquake in Chile. And so it focuses on a group of people that are trying to survive after the quake. Of course, as people turn to like lawlessness, you know, I mean, it just becomes anarchy after mm. this earthquake. So that's, that is the premise of the film. I'm not sure if that was made before or after green hell, but I kind of think it was made it was his his film after Green Hell, um, but uh, I don't think he's made another feature film since then. You know, oh. it needs to come back. Oh, he does. He yeah. is one of he's one of horror. You know, I mean, look, it's kind of like he he kind of re retained a consistency in in horror. You know, I mean, he didn't slouch. I think Rob Zombie slouched. And I think that was what kind of the problem after a house of a thousand corpses and devil's rejects, he just kind of trailed off. I mean, people like, you know, the Halloween films. I don't know if you saw those. I saw those. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like, eh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? The second one was, I don't even know what that was about. That didn't even feel like a Halloween film. The first yeah. one was like a straight remake, quite boring. Right, right. And then yeah. the second one was just this weird, arty, didn't know what it was film. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I just very disappointing from Rob Zombie, you know. Um, but uh, so now was that, okay, so we got, was that the fourth Four. one? Okay. Yeah, it might so be what, the fourth one. So I've got to go for a fifth now. I'll, I'll go more recent. I, uh, I liked Malignant. That was good. Malignant? Yeah. No, I don't think oh, so. Oh, well. Add it to the list. Okay. It's uh yeah, James Wan. I don't really want to give much away about this one, but it's a little bit of a Giallo homage. Oh, nice. Wan. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's James Wan doing a lot of his usual tricks as well. But um. Ah, so okay. I don't want to don't want to 
you know, spoil anything. I think you, you, you'll like that one a lot. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool, man. I'm always, yeah, you know, if it's, if it's, uh, there's a certain, I mean, you know, it depends with Giallo, right? And, and you know yeah. this, you know, it's like, it's either hit or miss. It's kind of, I do like a lot of the old, of course, the Italians where the, you know, where it kind of originates with, with uh, Argento and Bava and all these yeah. people. They, there's just some fantastic Giallo films. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But then again, there's some real crap that they they did as well it was kind of like you know the craze happened kind of in the 70s and 80s there was just like this outpouring of giallo films you mm -hmm. know in that in that uh especially in italy and so there's kind of like a lot of hit or miss in that in, in the in the sub genre you know yeah uh, it just kind of depends but uh i was just who was it we were talking, yeah, we were talking about Unsane, Tenebre. Tenebre, yeah. Yeah. That, and I would, I would call that Giallo. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. It's, I mean, it's Argento Giallo. So he yeah. kind of kicks another gear into it, you know, <laughs> because it's Argento. Yeah. You know, he's just, in that film, it's just got so many great things working for it. it it's, uh, who is it? Uh, James Franciscus? Who's the guy the that? The main guy. Yeah, yeah, the main actor. He's really good. I mean, he's the and he's the writer, right? He's the, yeah. he's the novelist, right? Uh, and uh, I think it's James Franciscus. I I believe. The only I mean, one I recognize is uh, it was Argento's wife at the time, wasn't it? That she plays a part, and John Saxon, of course, is in that. Yeah, John Saxon is also yeah. in it. You know, I mean, it's and it's just great. The sequences are fantastic. Uh, and it's Ar Argento just hitting his stride. You know, he's really like just on it uh, during that period of time. I, I just he you know, he's just like, look, I'm going to take the camera and I'm going to make it do things that nobody else has done before. That was really what his thing was, you know, yeah. and in that film. He just goes nuts, you know. He just really—it's just some great, like the you know the camera through the shirt that gets ripped. Oh yeah, and, the uh, splat just, of blood. Yeah, yeah, it's so great, and it's like I think that's the same scene. It's the camera is like vertically moving up a building. Yeah, before it, is it goes. Yeah, yeah, it goes into the room, and it's just like yeah, this is what you do. You know, it's like creative being creative with the camera not a lot of people do that a lot of people will just you know it's straight shots you're you you want to get from point a to point b to tell the story mm. and that's fine so it, it works you know you can god you can look at a lot of i would say that even like if you look at a film like hostel it's very straightforward cinematography you know it's like he's not pulling many tricks in that film it's just really well done and well edited, you know. It helps you. It helps pull you in when it's like that. Especially when you get long takes as well. It helps pull you yeah. into the film more. When the modern day editing, it's very ADHD, isn't it? it, it oh man, it's ridiculous. It's it's so bad. I, I just that's one thing that, and it's like it follows through with, frankly, just about everything. Steve, if you watch like people. You'll have like, you know, quote unquote YouTubers, if you watch their videos, mm. what they'll do is they'll edit every split second where there's a pause out of their video. Yeah. So when they're speaking, it's just like, they're just jump cuts, like the, the same, the same image, but they're just getting every last second of dead space mm. out of that. And, and I'm just like, why, what is your, what is the point here? What, what are you trying to, are you just trying to make it look like you're so professional that you're perfect or <laughs> that you can, yeah. you know, string a bunch of sentences together rapidly? I don't know, but that is like, that is a, uh, it's just like a staple of mm. the YouTuber class, you know? So 
that is it's a it's fantastic with somebody like Argento, as you're just saying, where man, you can have one shot and it's just going and going. And that was one thing I loved about also same period, you know, the uh, we're talking seventies and eighties with uh uh she's Carrie, uh, Brian De Palma. Brian De Palma, yes. That's who I was thinking, actually. Yeah, yeah. he would just have this great knack of doing a shot. And, and also, he would do your split screens. Mm-hmm. You know, well, like if there was like action, like some tense sequence happening, he would split the screen. Like in Carrie, she's on the stage. And you on the other, the yeah, you can see the dudes like planning the whole thing. Yeah. They're under the stage, they're rigging the bucket, and she's like smiling, you know, in the split screen. And it's slow motion. Everything is, he's just really digging in the suspense, you know. And uh, yeah, so Argento would do that as well. That was just yeah. a great, great thing that he was able to do. Um, but, uh, you know, that, now I, I've got to ask you, did you ever see that film? And this is just getting back to the 21st century, uh, you know, uh, horror films. Yeah. There, I, I think it's 2007, a film called Pontypool. No, I didn't see that one. Oh, you check it out. you got to right. see this movie. It is a horror okay. film. It takes place on in one set. One set. And it's a radio station. And the whole thing of the film is that it's not what you see, it's what you hear. Okay. And it was based upon, yeah, it's based upon a novel called uh, Pontypool Changes Everything. And then it was made into a stage play because it's a perfect setup, right? It's just one set and yeah. it's, a, it's a radio station. And uh, man, it is, it is just wicked. It is a, I, 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 it's just one of my favorite. Not only is it like, you know, the, it's gripping. <clears throat> it sucks you in as the film goes and it doesn't take much time. You, it just you, gets to the point where you're like, what the hell is going on? And it's, there are some, graphic scenes i'll I'll say there there are a few graphic scenes but that's not the point of the thing uh it's everything you hear right everything you you gotta see this film to believe it trust me you will i think you will love this film pontypool uh and uh, it's just it's fantastic if you get a chance check it out Uh, i believe 2007 the lead actor, uh, Stephen McHattie, he has been in a ton of movies. You will recognize him right off the bat. Uh, he was in uh, Cronenberg's A History of Violence. Oh, yeah. um, he uh, he was that. He's the baddie uh, that uh, gets that that uh, kind of uh, terrorizes the coffee shop. That's the guy. Is it the uh, older guy or the younger yes, guy? Yes, the older guy. The older guy. The yeah. older guy. Okay. That's Stephen McHattie. He plays a DJ in this film, and he's just golden. This guy, it's just a, one of those performances that you just, man, that's what you do. That's how you do it. So, uh, yeah, the acting is fantastic. Everything. I mean, you know, you would think like, Jesus, how can you do a 90-minute film on one set mm-hmm. and make it work? How does that work? This is how it works in Pontypool. It's the, it's just brilliant in that in that the way that they are able to maintain such a level of suspense and horror and this idea of inescapable dread. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's all I can really uh, you know. It's the only way to to describe it without. I don't want to give any too much away. away. Yeah. Right, exactly. You know, but highly recommended. One of my favorite, I would definitely put it in my top five, uh, you know, of this century. And probably, I-, I might even be tempted to put it in my top 10 of all time. Oh, wow. 
Okay. Yeah, it's one of those. Strong not, endorsement. Yeah, it, I, I, it's just hard to, you know, and I do like, I, you know, I mean, I like gore and, you know, graphic violence like the next uh, horror fanatic. This film proves that you don't need much to mm. really get the point across. Um, so, yeah, that's just one of my favorites. You know, it's just it's it's up there. Uh, hey, there's Devil Flyer. He's he's popped in. Hello, good lord, Devil Flyer Rex. I'm gonna. There we go. Very cool. Um, yeah, it's you know it it's one it's it's a unique film. It kind of reminds. It, there's a certain uniqueness. Have you ever heard of a film called Primer? No, I've not heard of that one. Okay, then once again, I believe not that's two thousand five. It's a science fiction thriller. I would I would call it that. I wouldn't go as far as horror, although there are some some really insane things that happen. But what it is is a science fiction film. It was made for I think the budget was eight thousand dollars. Right. And it uh, has no special effects. It's a science fiction film with no special effects. Hmm. There you go. But it is one of the best science fiction films I've seen in the last 30 years. Easily. It's great. The concepts, it's a, it's a time travel film. It is so screwed up. Man, I mean, it is the type of time travel that I would agree that that the basis for it, you know, there are different types of time travel that are explained, yeah. right? Like, for instance, so you, you might have somebody that says, OK, look, my my you know, this character goes back in time to kill Hitler. Well, OK, but that creates a catch 22, doesn't it? It's a paradox, because if you kill Hitler before before. Uh, he, you know the things that he does during World War II. None yeah. of that's happened. It then changes your universe. So Maybe you might not have even been born. Right. Yeah. So the only thing it can really do is that it must be based upon infinite dimensions, uh, infinite parallel universes. So it changes one of those. But when you go back, you just go back to your own universe or to a parallel universe where things have changed, but you still exist. Right. You know, it doesn't change your, it doesn't stop you from being born, but you can't go back to your, you can't go back. Your original home. time. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Your original time, your original universe, whatever. And that would make sense. And so this film kind of follows that logic, but without giving much away, here's the premise. These two guys, they're scientists. They're working on something else entirely. They accidentally discover time travel, with what they're working upon. And so, like many humans, they immediately think, huh, what can we do with this? And so that's the premise of it. And, and of course, things start going horribly wrong. Right. That, that is basically an $8,000 film. The acting is fantastic. Uh, I think you would totally dig it. I love it because it's such a micro-budget film that works beautifully. You know, once again, proving that you don't need money to make a good film. So, yeah, that is cool. the thing. Yeah, yeah, I'll add that one to the list then. Yeah, it's good. It's good, man. Well, I see we're, wow, we, we're almost at the 90-minute mark. Wow. Went a lot longer yeah. than I thought we would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was going to struggle. <laughs> oh no, man! I tell you, once I, and I, as I was saying, once we get talking about stuff, subjects, yeah. and there, there's been a lot, you know. And getting back to let's, you know, kind of roll back to to your book. I want to tell people that uh, you got you guys have to check out a hot dose of hell. It is available on Amazon. I've got it up on the screen now. I have got the link to the book in my description and uh yeah i highly recommend it if you want a really good adrenaline fueled 
uh, gore fest. And I would call, I would definitely say it's, it's definitely graphic. It is not for people with weak stomachs. No. If you can't handle that, I would definitely say kind of avoid it because you, you've got to really be into it. Well, you've got to be a real horror fan to get into it, you know, to, to, how should I say this? Uh, to stomach the yeah. in, intense gore. It is great. It is fantastic. You know, it, Horror fans, real horror fans, will love this novel. That's what I'm going to say about it. You know, excellent. Uh, Thanks, Mike. Yeah, you're absolutely welcome. Thank, thank you, Steve, for coming on. Anytime, and, Mike. And and where where sh where can people find you? What's the best uh, uh, place? best place to find me? Uh, Getter, True Social, and I am on the uh, the Bird app as well. Unfortunately, but you won't find That's me on there very app. often. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so get her in true social. You know, yeah. I tried signing up for, I did sign up for true social and those bastards haven't let me in yet. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Maybe I've got to try it again. Yeah. Uh, you know, this was way, this was early on before the thing was even live. Right. You know, they, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't let us in at all over here for a while. You can, oh, it wasn't even launched in the UK for a long time. So. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, it's maybe only just last couple months, I think. Maybe I just have to go and and uh, try and sign up again now. You know, yeah. maybe that, I don't know, or maybe they just don't like me. That's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea. Uh, but uh, all right, well, it's been a pleasure, Steve. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Show. And uh, you know, uh, this will be, of course, this is recorded. It's going to be on my channel uh, for people to watch uh, whenever they want, you know. Uh, so there is that. It's recorded for posterity. And uh, once again, thank you, uh, everyone. And I will talk to you soon. Okay.